I was going through some things the other day. I was going through a, um, a folder, and as I was going through this folder, I found four envelopes. And I looked at these envelopes, because I'm kind of a weird person when it comes to saving money. I looked at these four envelopes, and I said to myself, I forgot about this. And immediately when I saw the four envelopes, I knew that there was $25 in each envelope. It didn't take a, a, a mathematician to figure that out. There was 100 bucks that I'd forgotten about. And the Lord spoke to me and He said, there are some things that have been forgotten that needs to be reintroduced. And I said, Lord, what are you saying? And He said, there are some things that people have disengaged from, that they need to re-engage. There's some things that we used to hug that we don't hug no more. And I asked the Lord, I said it like this, basically I said, Lord, are we going old school? And He said, no, you're going to my Word. I want you to look into my Word. So I went to Exodus chapter 3, and that's where we're going this morning is Exodus chapter 3. And you got to understand that Moses now, he had been a priest in the house of Pharaoh. He had been a priest, a Hebrew, that was found in the Nile River by Pharaoh's daughter. How many of you remember that? As a baby in a little ark pitched with mud. And he was pulled out of that river. He was raised by Pharaoh's daughter. He became a priest in the house. Everybody say this, say 40 years. So for 40 years he was there, but one day him being not an Egyptian, but Moses being a Hebrew, he saw an Egyptian beating up on one of his Hebrew brothers, and he slew or killed the Egyptian. So it got out. The Bible says that he looked this way and that way he killed the Egyptian for beating up on his Hebrew brother. And then he ran for his life. He ends up in a place where he became a shepherd at 40 years old. He married a woman, a daughter of Jethro. Jethro became his father-in-law, and Jethro was the priest of Midian. I'm finding out a lot of people don't know these stories. They don't know these stories. We're going to have to re-embrace some things because it's speaking to the time and the place where we're at. So we see now that Moses is keeping the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, who is the priest of Median. And he led the flock, Moses did, to the backside or the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb or Mount Sinai. Everybody say this with me. Say, Moses has an understanding of the wilderness. I want you to see this. Do you see it? He led the flock to the backside or the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb or Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. It says, The angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in a flame of fire of the midst of a bush that was burning, but not being consumed. And Moses said, I will turn now aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to Moses. Everybody say, God called. God called to Moses out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. God said, Do not come near, but take your shoes off of your feet, for the ground on which you are standing is holy ground. Also he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Everybody say, Close Encounter. 
And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt's bondage and are being held captive to the Egyptians. I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters and their oppressors. For I know the children of Israel, I know their sorrows, I know their sufferings, and I know their trials. Now watch now, verse 8. I love how God puts this. God says, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand and the power of Egypt. Everybody say, when God comes down. He said, I have come down to deliver them out of the hand and the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up out. Everybody say, up out. I have come to bring them up out of that land to a land good and large, a land flowing with milk and honey, a land of plenty, a land of prosperity, a land of increase, to the place of Canaan. Verse 9 says, Now behold, the cry of the Israelites, my people, has come to me, and I have seen how the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, Moses, and I will send you, Moses, to Pharaoh. Now here it is. That you, Moses, may bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Everybody say, out of Egypt. Verse 10, God said to Moses, Come now, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt's bondage. Verse, verses 15 through 17, And God said more to Moses. God said also to Moses, This shall you say to the Israelites. I want you to declare this to the Israelites, my people. The Lord, the God of your father, of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and by this name I am to be remembered to all generations. Go gather the elders of Israel together, the mature teachers and tribal leaders, and say to them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, appeared to me, saying, I have surely visited you, and have seen that which is done to you in Egypt's bondage. And I have declared, listen now, and I have declared... God saying this through Moses to the children of Israel. And I have declared and decreed that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt. Everybody say, up out of the affliction of Egypt. To the land that is flowing with milk and honey, the land of Canaan. Now, if you're with me, shout yes. Yes. So God says to Moses concerning the children of Israel, I will bring you up out of of the affliction of Egypt to a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, everybody say up. The word up meaning a place, a position that is higher. Everybody say another level. Say another dimension. How many of you would like to go to another level, another dimension? Lift your hand and shout yes. I'm talking in your walk with God. Now, I want to say something to you. I know there's those of you here today that you're tired or know you're here today. That you know what? We've been fighting this COVID thing and now the, the, the variants. How many of you hear what I'm saying? If you're with me, just wave at me. Okay, we know. We hear all of these reports daily. And I know that there's people tired. Flat, worn out. Going back to my roots, tuckered out. But I want, I want to build something in you today. I want to revisit some things that nobody talks about anymore. Everybody say, I have a promise. I have a promise. Have a promise. There is a promise. Now, now stay with me because we're going to address some things. The word up meaning a place, a position that is higher. To obtain, you must rise, you must stand up. Be ready to move to a higher level of volume, activity, prosperity, and increase. Moving towards a higher place. That's what the word up there means. When God says, I am going to bring the children of Israel up out of the affliction of Egypt. Now watch this. The word out meaning to move away from a particular place. How many of you are ready to move away from a particular place? And listen, I'm not talking about you leaving here and going to Texas. You hear what I'm telling you? God gave me a land, and I'm going to keep it. 
God made a promise, and I'm not leaving. I'm not going to leave. Everybody say, not leaving. Digging my heels in. God made me a promise. I heard him loud and clear. Moses heard God loud and clear. God wasn't clear in his voice. Stay with me. Hear what I'm saying. The word out mean means to move away from a particular place. I'm talking in the spiritual realm. In the spiritual realm, I'm moving away some, from some particular places. I'm not having anything to do with it anymore. I'm not having anything to do with your fear. I'm not having anything to do with being undivided. I'm not having anything to do with resentment. I'm not having anything to do with jealousy. I'm not having anything to do with condescending judgmental remarks. I'm not having anything to do with this thing that brings division and does not love people in spite of indifference. Differences. I'm moving away from some things. Everybody say up and out. Up and out. I'm going to preach this just like I'm going to be me. So get ready for two hours. Wait a minute, you went shopping for two hours yesterday. And you played golf for four. You went to the lake for eight. You got in at 9.30 last night. Okay, go on. Everybody say, go on. Moving away. The word out means to move away from a particular place. No longer, listen, no longer detained. How many of you feel like you've been detained? Lift your hand real high. I mean, lift your hand high. You feel like you have been detained. You feel like you should be further along in your relationship with God. This is not a condescending word. I believe that the Father is calling us to a higher place of praise, a higher place of worship, and a higher place of service. But many people become detained. This is what God was saying. I'm going to move you out, away from a particular place, the place being Egypt. No longer will you be detained, he was telling the children of Israel, in Egypt. I'm going to move you towards the land that flows with milk and honey. The land God promised, Canaan. Moving towards living in God's promised destiny concerning your life. How many of you want to obtain your destiny that God has for you? Lift your hand and shout yes. The destiny that God has for you, not the destiny you have planned for yourself. I'm going to challenge that this morning. Not the destiny that I have for myself, not the plans that I make up for myself, but the destiny that God has for me, the destiny that God has for you. And sometimes it takes time to get this right. To get this, look right here, to get this in alignment with this. Sometimes it takes time. It might even take 40 years to get this lined up with this. I have seen people walk in the Word and then all of a sudden get distracted and stop walking in the Word and say, boy, that sounds like a good idea. How many of you hear what I'm saying? I have had to deal with distractions, attractions, and carnal interruptions in the last two years like never before. Not only in my own life, but in the lives of other people. Well, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this. And I said, wait a minute. What has God said? Well, you know what? I see everybody else. I don't do what everybody else does. Just because I see you doing something, it might be what God told you to do. That's not mean what God told me to do. It's not what God has put over this house as a covering. It's not, listen, it's not follow you. It's follow, it's, everybody say follow God. Follow God. What is this thing about following God? He led Daniel into a lion's den. He led Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into a fiery furnace. And we run from lion's dens and we run from fiery furnaces today. We don't run to, uh, listen, Daniel, did, did, listen, they cast Daniel into that lion's den. And I, I don't even read where he was fighting it, but he could, because he knew the plan of God. And, and all of a sudden, King Darius come over there and he leaned over and he looked into that lion's den and he said, Oh, Daniel, faithful servant of the Lord. And all of a sudden, after a few days, Daniel speaks up and he says, Oh, 
king live forever. And then all of a sudden, because Daniel was delivered from the lion's den, he became a voice in the land. One of the reasons we have not become a voice in the land like we should be because we run from lion's dens and we run from fiery furnaces. Yeah, that went over like a lead balloon. No, I want a place of safety. The lion's den was the safest place he could have been because it was God's will. The fiery furnace was the best place that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego could have ever been because it was the safest place. And then all of a sudden when they come out of the fiery furnace, what did the king say? He said, man, let the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be praised. And he began to put them as leaders over provinces. Somebody said, yeah, but you don't understand. No, 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 no. You got to get this lined up with this. Because I want to tell you something. This, your, your brain, human logic and human reasoning, what society thinks and what culture thinks and what scientists say, uh, you ain't listening to me this morning. Are you listening? What does God say? Does this book have priority in your life? And do you take God for what He says, or do you take what God says and make it fit what you think? Woo! Yeah, come on, somebody, woo with me. Woo! Yeah, come on. Woo! You're going to go there, aren't you? Yes. Yes. Here we go. Exodus chapter 10, Exodus chapter, or Exodus chapter 3, verse 10, Exodus chapter 3, verse 17. God says to Moses concerning the children of Israel, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to a land flowing with milk and honey. Okay, now listen to this. God says, I'm moving you up out of the affliction of Egypt. Affliction meaning, listen now, affliction meaning God says, I'm moving you out of the depression. I'm moving you out of the misery. I'm moving you out of the trouble of Egypt. Everybody say out. Say up and out. Affliction also means variant. Look it up. Dave Cox. Did I not come and get you and say, look at this, I want four eyes on this. The word affliction means variant. I have not heard this anywhere. I'm bringing it to you. Remove me from this place. Yeah, how many of you hear what I'm saying? Shout yes. Remove me from this place. I am no longer going to be detained from what I know God has said for me and this house. Listen. The word affliction means depression, misery, and trouble, but it also means variant. A form of or a version of something that differs in some respect from other forms of the same thing, or from a standard, a false point of reference. Listen. God says, I'm moving you up out of the variant of Egypt. I'm moving you up out of a form of disorder. I'm going to bring you up out of a version of mental misrepresentation. I'm bringing you out of a form, a version of mental misrepresentation. I'm going to bring you up and out of a standard that has been established through a false point of reference. Listen to me. 
God says, I'm moving you away from the variant, the trouble, the misery, the depression of Egypt. I'm moving you away from what man, society, culture has developed. I'm moving you away from what man, human logic, and reasoning has created. I am moving you away from what society has created into what God has promised. How many of you want what God has promised? Lift your hand and shout, yes. I'm not telling you not to have wisdom. You have wisdom. There's been several dozens of people that have called and said, we're not feeling good this morning. We're going to stay at home. And I said, if we're going to fail, we're going to fail on a side of caution. What I'm talking about right now is not really have anything to do with your physical man. It is has everything to do with your spiritual man. It has to do with a woman that no man can see, only you and God. It, only, it has to do with the man that only you and God know about. Only those thoughts that you think that nobody else knows about. Who you really are, only between you and God. All them little secrets. Everybody say, my inner man. What I'm talking about right now is spiritual. I'm telling you right now, if there's a COVID in the natural, there's a COVID in the spiritual. Somebody said, you're eyeballing me. Well, sure I am. I'm talking to you. Somebody said, well, you must not have had COVID. Yeah, I did. Felt like my arms were going to fall off and felt like my legs were going to come out of the sockets. My daughter would call me up, and she'd say, Dad, and I'd say, what, baby? She said, you get up and make sure you, make sure you walk today. You get up and you walk. You work yourself out. You get up and you walk, and then you go and you lay back down. But when you wake up, you get up and you go again. You exercise every day. Exercise nothing. <laughs> Can I tell you something? I felt like laying in that bed, but because I knew that I needed to get up and exercise and exercise these lungs, and fill these lungs up completely, everybody say completely, to the point of where it got to where I could only walk to the dining room table. Walk back and I'd lay down. Kathy told me, she said, I've never seen you sick before. She said, this is only the second time. I said, Kat, I'm going to clean this up. I feel like dumb. But if it's in the physical, I'm telling you right now, uh-uh. no, we're not, we're not backing up. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. I've already had a place offered to me in Oklahoma. I ain't going. Look at me, free. They asked Kathy, they said, are you done? If you're done, you can live here. I went like this. How many of you know, if you're not careful, this will not line up with? If you're not careful, you get off track and this. And somebody says, well, I'm going to go to heaven anyway. I'll go to heaven. You know what? There's a permissive will and there's a perfect will. Boy, um, I read over there in Romans chapter 12 where it talks about that you may know the perfect will of God for you. How many of you want to know the perfect will? Lift your hand and say yes. Look, look, talk to me this morning. Everybody shout Yes. Huh, you ain't going to sleep on me. I don't care if we are all tired. No, and you're not going to give up. Uh -uh. Won't let you. Mm -mm. Won't let you. Somebody said, well, you're not my boss. No, but I know one that is, and he'll move heaven and earth for you. Listen, put too much into this thing to let a spiritual COVID run us out of town. Had to say that right because we're on YouTube. Spiritual COVID. How many of you come in contact with this spiritual COVID and you don't even know it? You used to read your Bible, but you don't read it no more. You just wait for somebody to send you a text that's got the Bible quote of the day. Boy, it's getting cold in here. I, need, I should have wore my thermals. God says, I'm delivering you out of the variant, out of the false version and standard into God's promised destiny, a land flowing with milk and honey. The word flowing meaning to flow freely, 
to overflow, to gush out, to be so full that the contents extends above the sides, up, out, over the top, excessive surplus, more than enough, a super abundant, abounding supply. Look at this. I want to show you how many. 16.9 full ounces. This whole 16.9 full ounces. Everybody say overflow. overflow. Say it again. Say overflow. God says, I'm going to move you into an overflow, simply meaning you are not in the overflow yet to the children of Israel, but I'm going to move you into an overflow. Is a fool. God says, I'm going to move you into this. Look, it's running down my arm. It's getting all over my suit. It's, run, it's going to start running out here in a minute. Look. See? Somebody said you're crazy. No, I got a good cleaners. Now listen, listen, listen. How long has it been since you've been? Here. How long has it been since you've been here? How come we don't want to? You don't get here by doing your own thing. Somebody said, but I got plans. God does too. Somebody said, yeah, but God will yeah, God'll let you do what you want to do. That ain't enough for me. That ain't enough for this house. I want to show you a false overflow, okay? I want to show you a false overflow. When the pressure comes on and somebody squeezes it, that ain't real. That ain't, that, yeah, that ain't real. That ain't real overflow. See, look, that ain't real overflow. You're more empty than you've ever been before in your life. you got to always have something coming in. Everybody say something coming in. See, that's real overflow, right? How many of you hear what I'm saying? Some of you are worried about the floor. Don't worry about the floor. Look at me. I'm going to say it. That ain't overflow. That is not overflow. You know what that is? You got under pressure. Now look, it's half empty, but there's nothing coming in. If there's nothing coming in, it gets to the point, oh, it wasn't as much as before. What do you got to do? What, what do we got to do? Everybody say, get in the overflow. Watch now. Got to stay where it's coming in. Everybody say, constant overflow. Turn to the one next to you and say, he's crazy. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm really not. I'm not. I'm not crazy. I'm making a point. I'm just going to do it. And then what happens is because you haven't been in a constant flow, look. Look at the bottle. What's happened to it? It's disfigured. And then it just takes a wind, straightens it all. Somebody said, this ain't Bible. Sure is a good example, isn't it? Okay, now stay with me because we're not even anywhere close to being done yet. Why do you continue to beat up on yourself? Come on in. If you're not careful, you'll become your own worst enemy. If you're not careful, you won't give yourself room to fail because you think you have to be perfect. There's only one perfect one. I fall and I get up. I fail. I'm not talking about getting caught up in some great sin. I'm just talking about situations and circumstances. The other day, man, I'll tell you what. I, I just flat out got ticked off. Everybody say ticked off. And, and I said, I'm going to go tell them about it. And God said, if you do, that's sin. He said, I want you to wash the dish and to get the peanut butter off of the knife, I want you to wash them, and I want you to dry them, and I want you to put it up without saying a word to them. I said, that ain't me. And he said, no, that's me. I got to get this lined up with this. I said, Lord, I won't go tell them that they need to wash their own dishes. I'm getting tired of washing their dishes. How many of you have ever been there? Wave at me. How many of you think that this ain't silly? What I'm talking about, this is real stuff, man. 
You just got to have your say. You just got to tell somebody. You got to put them in their place. They need to do it the way you do it. (laughs) Stay with me. Boy, this is going to go over great. Wow. How many of you are ready to get into the overflow? Shout yes. Now, how many of you are really ready to get into the overflow? Watch now. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 24, something changes. God says, but I have said to you, you shall inherit their land. And I will give it to you, here it is, the first time it's mentioned, to possess. A land flowing with milk and honey. Everybody say possess. A land flowing with milk and honey. The word possess means to occupy. You will drive out. It means you will drive out the previous tenants and possessing in their place. You're going to establish victory. You're going to succeed. You're going to enjoy. You're going to cast out those that occupy and celebrate. It's talking about increase. We are going to possess and have abundance. We're going to possess and have increase. We are going to deal with a variance. Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 8 says this. Listen real closely now. God says, Behold, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give unto them and their seed after them. Everybody say this with me. Seed after me. Look now. Say generational blessing. Say it again. Say generational blessing. The blessing of possessing what God has promised. The blessing of possessing what God has promised. Man, there's so many promises in this book that the Father has made available to you and I. Everybody say, no, the promise. There's a blessing of possessing. Deuteronomy chapter 2 through chapter 12 all talks about possessing the land. Uh, Chapter 15, 17, 19, 21, 23, and 25 of Deuteronomy all talks about possessing the land that flows with milk and honey. Possess the land and increase. Come into a prosperity. Physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, relationally, financially, come into this increase. The word increase means, here now, to become And some of you have heard this before. To become or make greater. To become or make greater in size, amount, intensity, and or degree. The way that God was going to make the children of Israel greater, He was going to make them greater as they go forward and come up and out of Egypt into the land of promise. But look now, don't rebuke your wilderness because it's your wilderness, listen to me now, that increases your capacity to have more of God. It will stretch you. Don't curse this time. How many of you hear what I'm saying? Say yes. Watch now. To become or make greater in size, amount, intensity, or degree. It means to grow, to enlarge, to expand, to swell, to multiply. The root word, the Hebrew word for increase is rabbah. It means to multiply, to grow greater in all areas, no lack, to excel, to mature. To grow, mature, and excel in authority, to grow, mature, and excel in value, to grow, mature, and excel in scopes. Scopes, which means discernment. How many of you know we need discernment today? Say yes. What is discernment? Listen, I want to tell you what it is. It's a spiritual gift that allows believers to recognize lying spirits and to identify deception. Just because it's got a gold chain hanging around its neck with a big old cross on it doesn't mean it's Christ-like. Listen. What are you talking about? I want my promise. Somebody said, I've heard this all my life. But but no, wait a minute. Uh Uh-uh. I'm not talking about coming in here and doing things your way or my way. I'm talking about doing it God's way. Listen. Can we do it God's way? Can the children of Israel do it God's way? They wandered for 40 years. And I asked a guy the other day, I said, how come they wandered for 40 years? And he said, because they couldn't get their tongues in alignment. And I'm telling you this. Listen to me. We got to get this word and our mind. It's, we got to line up our mind with the word. Listen, God gave them specific orders. How many of you still with me? Say yes. Now watch. So 
To grow, mature, and excel in discernment. To grow, mature, and excel in territories. To grow, mature, and excel physically, mentally, emotionally, relationally, financially, spiritually. To grow, mature, and excel in every area. The rabbi of God. John 10, 10, New Testament. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. I want you to enjoy life to the full until it overflows. That's what God was saying to the children of Israel in the Old Testament. I want you to bring you into a land that is flowing. It's overflowing with milk and honey. Prosperity and increase. Everything that you could ever imagine or want. Same thing Jesus is telling us here in John 10 and 10. I have come. Jesus said, I have come. It sounds like he's saying, I'm your promised land. That you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. I was looking through that folder and I saw these four envelopes and I opened them up. And when I opened the first one, I remembered. I put $25 in each one of those. I put it away. And forgot about it. Now that ain't like me. Because when it comes to money, I'm tight. (laughs) How many of you know what that means? When my wallet comes out, it goes. I was looking through that folder and I found those four envelopes. And I said to myself, I forgot about these. And the Lord spoke to my heart and he said, there's some things you forgot about. And then this is the way I wrote it down like I felt he spoke it to me. You want to possess the land and experience the increase, but you must re-embrace some things you have disengaged from. I'm just setting the platform to get to where we need to go today. I want you to look at me, Heather. God didn't bring you in this house to settle for less. God hadn't brought you here this morning. We are not going to settle for less. We're going for God's best and for God's rest. How many of you with me? Say yes. Now now watch. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 31. God commands the children of Israel, For you shall pass over, cross over the Jordan River to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God gives you and you shall possess it and live in it. Everybody say possess and live in. Listen now, talking about the blessing of God, talking about the promise of God. You shall possess the promise and you shall live in the promise. There are two crossings. Listen now. The children of Israel, when they came out of Egypt's bondage, they crossed the Red Sea. Everybody say the crossing of the Red Sea. So God parts the Red Sea and the children of Israel was given an escape from the enemy. God parted the Red Sea so the children of Israel could run from the enemy. But now 40 years later, God is parting the Jordan River so the children of Israel can invade the enemy. Something happened in those 40 years. Some things had to die. There were some things that weren't practiced in those 40 years. Some things that were very important. One of the things that's very important that wasn't practiced was something called circumcision. If we're not careful, and please don't anybody get upset at me, but I'm, I'm going to say this. If we're not careful, we just pull it back and go on talking about the flesh. For 40 years, there was no circumcision. Do you know all the men of war that came out of Egypt died? All those that were circumcised died. Now all these children that were born over the next 40 years had never been circumcised. They are full of excess flesh that if not careful, carried disease if it wasn't cleaned right. So they just kept cleaning things that should have been cut off. And I'm telling you this right now, and I want you to hear me loud and clear. God's getting ready to call us together, Taylor. And he's getting ready to call us all together to a place called Gilgal. 
just like he did the children of Israel years and years ago. You know what gets me about the flesh? You can rebuke the flesh all you want to. You can rebuke it all you want to. You can rebuke it and rebuke it and rebuke it. But the flesh, the Bible doesn't teach us to rebuke the flesh. The Bible teaches us to crucify the flesh. You rebuke, you can rebuke a demon, it has to obey. But listen, your flesh, listen, this flesh, Paul says, I have to bring my body under subjection on a daily basis. I have to crucify my flesh. I have to discipline my flesh. How many of you hear what I'm saying? But if we're not careful, all of a sudden, years have went by, and there hasn't been a circumcision of the heart. Excess flesh. It's kind of crazy. It's like the flesh has the ability to resurrect itself through what you think. How many of you are still with me? It's getting awful quiet in the potter's house. So I ask you, are you going to go and try to overcome? Are you going to try to obtain your destiny with excess flesh in your life? Listen to me now. How many of you are still with me? Say yes. Hear this. There were two crossings, the crossing of the Red Sea. God parted the Red Sea and the children of Israel was given an escape to run from the enemy. God parted the Jordan River so the children of Israel could invade and conquer the enemy. Something happened in the 40 years. There was a mentality change. We're not running no more. We're invading. We're going to throw the first blow. We're not waiting on the enemy to throw the first blow. We're going to. Listen now, the Red Sea represents a type of leaving the world system, all of the idols and the lust of the world behind. The Jordan River represents, I'm going to say it like this, a baptism, a dying to self. The old carnal fleshly, death to flesh. Everybody say death to flesh. The old carnal fleshly man obeying God, going into the fullness, the fullness of Christ. Jordan in the Hebrew means going down, subdued, laid low. Death to all that is unlike Christ, all idolatry, all self-centeredness, going all the way with God. When we cross this Jordan River, it represents a baptism of flesh, the old nature, carnality. Now watch and hear this. God is a good God, and He knows what is best for you. How many of you believe that God knows the best way for you to live and that He has the best plan for you? Lift your hand real high. Okay, stay with me. God is a good God, and He knows what is best for you. He desires to lead you into His best and His rest. Something good is going to happen to me and for me. Something good is going to happen to you and for you. When you decide to wholeheartedly follow God, to wholeheartedly obey God, expect miracles. Start expecting miracles from God right now, today. He wants you to live in increase. He wants to bless you. He wants to prosper you. God is leading His healed children here into a land filled with blessing, filled with milk and honey, increase, abundance, and overflow in all areas, physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, relationally, and financially. God is leading and commanding His children into His ultimate place and purpose for His life. It's called God's destiny for your life. If we're not careful, we just get caught up in the routine. Oh, we've Children of Israel, can't you see it? They just keep going around the same mountain. Just keep doing the same things on a daily basis. And I understand you've got jobs and everything else. I get it. I was in a store yesterday. I was in a store yesterday. I walked in. I, I'm telling you, I, I talk about fried chicken every once in a while. I found a better fried chicken than where I'd been buying it. I'm not going to tell you. Because you've been buying it there too. You took my advice. But it's good. How many of you like fried chicken? That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. So, so I went into this store because there's something else I really like. I like tacos. But I just don't like any tacos. I like Kathy's tacos. She's got me spoiled. Well, Drusula, my mother-in-law, the war department, she's going back to Ethiopia. So she's leaving this morning, going back to Ethiopia. So we, we're going to have a little taco dinner for her because she likes tacos. So I go into a store, and I walk into the store, and I hear somebody actually scream my name. And I looked, we met eyes, and 
And, and, and when he did this, people went. Matter of fact, I went. I'm not saying that with ego or pride. Somebody said, what's your point? My point is that people's going to start crying out for answers. And I don't want to bring them an answer from the wilderness. I want to bring them an answer from the promised land. We want to start broadcasting from the promised land. How many of you hear what I'm saying? Shout yes. Somebody said, well, I'm in Christ. And you know, but, but, but listen to me. I'm not trying to say you're not. But how much flesh is in you? How much carnality is still left? What are you having to pull back what you should be cutting off? What is it that you're tolerating? Listen, what happens? How many of you still with me? Say yes. 40 years, listen, 40 years of wandering. Now they are under a new leader. They're under a brand new fresh mentality. His name is Joshua. Listen. It says this, it says, Now after the death of Joshua, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Everybody say, duh. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore, arise, go over this Jordan. He's already telling Joshua in the first, first two verses, I want you to get up and I want you to go over this Jordan. Everybody say, invade the promise. You and all these people into the land which I do give unto them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you as I said unto Moses. See, we say we've heard this all of our life. I want to ask you, are you living in your promised land? How are you living in your destiny? Most of the time what we do is we fulfill our destiny and then retire. I think it's time we get into our destiny and start living out of our destiny. Start, everybody say, start living. Out of our destiny. Somebody said, you're about 62 years old. You're about ready to retire. Ain't no plans for retiring in me. Uh-uh. I'm not going to retire. I'm going to do like the old timers say, refire. Listen to me now. There's some things that God wants to accomplish in the state of California. I better be careful there. And I wonder if he is divinely preparing us and strategically placing us to turn this thing around. How many of you with me? Lift your hand. But you ain't going to invade Jericho with a bunch of flesh in your life. You might invade it, but you ain't going to be victorious with a bunch of flesh in your life. we got to enter into this covenant, and this covenant is not talking about perfection. Adrena. It's not talking about perfection. It's talking about purity. Listen to me. How many of you are tired? See, I want to tell you what wears people out. It's not the Spirit of God that wears people out. It's not warring against the devil. It's your flesh. How many of you with me say yes? Listen to what the Bible says. The Bible says that the Spirit warreth against the flesh, and the flesh warreth against the Spirit, and the two are contrary one to another so that you cannot do the things that you would like to do. It didn't say so you wrestle against the devil and the devil wrestles against you. It says you wrestle against your flesh and the flesh wrestles against you. How many of you understand what I'm saying this morning? Shout yes. yes. Watch now. Listen, Carrie, I'm going to talk to you and Randy. You told me what's been keeping you tired. It wasn't your battle against the devil. It was the battle against your own flesh. You said when you got into the process where God dealt with you and dealt with your flesh, that's when things begin to change. So what God's getting ready to do, everybody gets excited about invading the promised land. Listen, I'm going to say something to you now, and you can read it in the text. You can read it in the Bible. This is what happened. The children of Israel, after 40 years of wandering, now they're under a new, they're under new, a new leadership. His name is Joshua. It also represents a new fresh mentality. 
So all of a sudden, God starts speaking to Joshua, and he says, I want you to cross this Jordan, and I want you to talk to your commanders, and I want you to get your commanders in shape, and I want your commanders then, when I give the order, to pass through the people and get the people ready to cross over the Jordan. How many of you with me say yes? God is giving a distinct order and a distinct command. Listen, so this is what happens. They go to the banks of the Jordan River, and the, and the order was when you see the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant of God step into the Jordan River, tell all the people to follow them and to stay 2,000, I think, cubits behind them. And when the priest carrying the Ark of God stepped into the Jordan River, the Jordan River the waters receded back. And they all stepped across, which represents, listen now, the Jordan River represents a baptism to the flesh, a baptism of death to your flesh. Listen now. The Bible says that they all crossed, went across the Jordan River. And then the priest stepped out and the waters came back together. And then, listen what it says. And the people came up out of Jordan on the tenth day of the first month and encamped in Gilgal. Gilgal. Everybody say it with me. Say Gilgal. It's a place, and one of the meanings is the rolling. So it says in Joshua chapter 5, At that time the Lord said unto Joshua, There was a gathering at Gilgal. All the people came to Gilgal. At that time, the Lord said unto Joshua, Make these sharp knives and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. This is what gets me. For 40 years, circumcision had not been practiced. And once before they left, into Egypt the day that they did was Passover. There was some things that they disengaged from that needed to be re-embraced. How many of you with me say yes? Now watch. So, the Lord spoke to Joshua and He said, Make these sharp knives of flint and circumcise the new generation of Israelites as before. Get rid of the excess flesh. Get rid of all that dead flesh, that carnality. Quit just pulling it back. Cut it off. Watch now. So Joshua made knives of flint and circumcised the sons of Israel. And this is the reason Joshua circumcised them. All the males of the people who came out of Egypt, all the men of war had died in the wilderness on the way after they came out of Egypt. Throughout, through all the people who came out, were, though all the people who came out were circumcised, yet all the people who were born in the wilderness on their way after Israel came out of Egypt had not been circumcised. I think there's some things that we need to revisit. Do you know that the flesh wants to control your life? Okay, I'm just going to get down to the nitty gritty now. Me and Kathy got in the car after pulling away from visiting some of our friends back east. We were gone for seven days, it wasn't a vacation. And she said, Tim, do you know what she said to me? And I said, no, because I was talking over in the other corner. She looked at me and said, are you guys about done in California? Are you about done? If you are, you can live here. I looked at Kathy and I said, what do you think? Because you can go here. Listen where you can go. I'm tired. I'm weary. God's got somebody better. How are you listening to me? You can make all the excuses in the world, my brother. But I'm telling you, 
It's time to know what God is saying and not giving way to your flesh. Because the flesh will get you out of sync. It will get you off track. And it will feel good for a season. I believe that God's calling us to a place called Gilgal. And it's because he wants to bless us. I want to ask you a question right now. I want you to be honest. How many of you here have been dealing with your flesh in a way like never before over the last six, seven, eight months. Lift your hand. I want you to lift them high. Get them up there. Break your elbows. Lift it high. Yeah, this is what I'm talking about. I refuse to give the flesh preeminence. I'm not going to. Mm -mm. Serve God too long to not to stay in the overflow. How many of you are ready to come into the overflow? I want everybody just to lift your hands and begin to, right now, check your hearts. Right now, go there and check your heart. We're almost done. I don't feel like I'm doing this justice. So Joshua made knives of flint and circumcised the sons of Israel. There had not been circumcision, but now watch, for 40 years. And then they had to be healed. Everybody say healed. Circumcision. I wonder if we need, and I'm talking spiritually, I wonder if we need to be circumcised again. I wonder if the flesh has had its way for so long with your mind. How many of you hear what I'm saying? Because I want to tell you something. The flesh will cause you to wander in the promised land just like you wandered in the wilderness. Do you know that they crossed the Jordan River and was in the promised land? They were in the promised land when circumcision was practiced. So the promised land is a place where the excess flesh is cut off and thrown away. And then there has to be a time of healing before we go and possess Jericho. How many of you want to invade Jericho and be successful? Lift your hand and shout, yes. You know what I believe, Tom? I believe there's a lot of people that have tried to invade Jericho, but they, when they invaded Jericho, they got defeated. And it's not because the Father's not a loving Father and a kind Father and a good Father. It's because sometimes, Tom, we just don't listen to Him. Stay with me. If this is making sense, shout yes. So watch now. They go to Gilgal. Circumcision is practiced. And it says in chapter 6 of Joshua, Now Jericho was straightly shut up. A fenced walled city, high walls, was tightly closed because of the Israelites. No one went in or came out. Jericho was shut up because of the Israelites. Listen now. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho, its king and the mighty men of valor, into your hands. You march around the enclosure, all the men of war, going around the city once. Thus you shall do for six days. And seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. And on the seventh day you shall march around the enclosure of Jericho seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. When they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and you hear Hear the sound of the trumpet. All the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the enclosure shall fall down flat in its place, and the people shall go over it, every man straight up before him. Okay, everybody, everybody say a plan was given. But after the flesh was dealt with. Now, I want to say this to you. God has always been specific in his plans. Listen to what he said. He told two of his disciples one day, he said, we need to have a place to eat the Passover supper. And this is what he said. He said, I want you, told his two disciples, to go into Jerusalem and there you will find a man with a water pot on his head. 
go to that man and say to that man, our master needs a place for the last to, for, for, for his supper. He said, you follow that man, and wherever he goes, you go into that house, and then you say to the master of the house, my master needs a place. But, but, but what if they had went, and they had followed a man just holding a pot? Everybody say specifics. If they had just followed a man holding a pot into the house, they might have got in the wrong house and got the wrong revelation. I don't want to get the wrong revelation. And I'm here to tell you this morning, I do not think that the devil has been our greatest enemy. I believe the flesh has been our greatest enemy. And I'm saying to this to people that's been saved, delivered, healed, and filled for a long time. If we're not careful, we better check our flesh level. How many of you hearing what I'm saying? Wave at me. So now here we are this morning. God's wanting to bring us into blessing. This is not a legalistic word. How many of you know that? Say yes. Because God knows the best life for you to live. And I want to begin to see men and women step into their destiny and then live out of their destiny here on earth. The children of Israel went into the promised land and followed the plan of God exactly like God had said it. There are some things that we contend with. There are. I've talked about road rage a lot in this house. I don't know how many times I've went into road rage. Here I am, got my wife in the car with me, just cruising along, and some guy comes off the off-ramp and almost runs us off the lane past the fast line. I mean just crazy. You stupid blankety blankety. No, no. Hear what I'm saying. I step on the gas and pull up next to him. Kathy said, Tim Sumner, you can't do this. I said, oh, yes, I can. How many of you ever did it? Come on, be honest. Yeah, see? Not perfect. How many times have I done that? You can't count the times I've done that. How many times have I resented somebody because they didn't clean up their mess? How many times? Listen, stay right here, look at me. No, I'm not. not. How many times I have resented somebody because they didn't clean up their mess? And I cleaned it up for them and resented it all the while I was doing it. Might as well not even done it. How many times have I been jealous? Filled with envy? How many times have I ever wanted to see somebody fail? How many of you ever wanted to see somebody fail so you could prove your point? Yeah, you folks are being honest. How many times have you felt lonely and you've said to yourself, well, they don't do this and they don't do this, but you never showed yourself friendly? The Bible says if you want to have friends, show yourself friendly. How many times have we debated in our mind over and over and over how things would be different if other people would do certain things? Poor little immature Christians. I don't believe this life is to be heavy, but I'm telling you right now, Diana, this life has responsibilities. And it comes with weight. 
My soul is tired this morning. My soul's tired. I'm not weak and I'm not backing up. But listen, if you don't go through the process, you have to. Listen. So I bring this word to you this morning. Now I'm going to ask you to be honest. And don't die in your flesh. Die to your flesh. If you're here right now and you know that this is a problem and it is stunning and dwarfing your spiritual life from obtaining the destiny that God has for you, I want you to stand your feet right now and I don't want you to be ashamed. I want you to stand.